Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this, the first of our Bonavero discussion groups uh, for Trinity Term 2021. We're really delighted to welcome today two people who have a relationship with the Bonavero Institute. Firstly, Professor Rodrigo Uprimni uh, from Colombia. He's joining us today from Bogotá. Uh, Professor Uprimni is um, one of the members of our advisory council, and he is also a emeritus professor at the Colombian National University, a founder member of the wonderful human rights NGO in Colombia, De Justicia, and very importantly for our conversation today, a member of the UN Economic, Social and Cultural Rights Committee, um, which was responsible for drafting and producing General Comment 25 on the right to science. So we're really delighted to have you here with us today, Rodrigo. Thank you for joining us, especially at such an early hour of the morning. Thank you, it's a pleasure. Thank you. And then, and then our other uh, speaker, the discussant, is uh, Dr. Leah Trueblood, who's an early career fellow at the Bonavera Institute. Um, she is um, also an early career fellow at Worcester College. She is working in the field of the right to science and particularly the question of the relationship between scientific knowledge, uh, scientists and policy making. She's just been awarded a British Academy grant to work in that field. We're really delighted that you could be here, Leah, thank you. So as you all know, the structure of this is that uh, our presenter um, will speak for 25 to 30 minutes, followed by our uh, discussant who will speak for 10 to 15 minutes. And then we will take Q&A from all of you who are present. Please note you'll see the Q&A uh, button at the bottom right hand corner of your screen, add the questions there, and then I will moderate those questions to Rodrigo and Leah um, at, uh, after their presentations. Uh, we'll be aiming to finish up at about quarter to two U, um, UK or British summer time, which is in about an hour and a quarter. So welcome again, Rodrigo. Please go ahead. We're looking very forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Kate. Uh, I began by thanking the Bonavero Institute uh, uh, for this invitation uh, to share some comments on our general comment on science and economic, social and cultural rights. Uh, a warm welcome also to Leah. It's a pleasure having this discussion with you. Um, what I'm going to do is not, uh, I'm not going to explain uh, in detail the general comment at the, as the general comment is available and you can read it and you have maybe already read it, but I think it might be more important to see what were the main decision taken to the committee for, uh, 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 for the drafting of the general comment and what are the possible uh, main contribution of the general comment according to my view. So uh, this explains the structure of my presentation. I will begin by the dilemmas and methodological decisions taken by the committee for the drafting of this general comment. And then the possible main contributions. Uh, of course, I will pick the, those that I, um, I, I think are the most important. Uh, and finally, I will finish uh, by some implications of, of the general comment in the current situation of the pandemic, uh, because it can be, I, I, we didn't plan the general comment to, to, to be made when the pandemic was come, uh, coming, of course. But I think it was a very timely general comment uh, for this situation. Uh, so first, uh, the dilemmas uh, or the methodological difficulties. Um, I think there were mainly four. The, the first one is the nature of the general comment. Um, uh, in, uh, usually general comments are a kind of systematization of the legal doctrine of a treaty body concerning usually a human rights or usually uh, the rights of a specific population or usually a phenomenon associated with uh, the, the enjoyment of, of human rights. Uh, these general comments uh, always have a mixture of what we can call the systematization of already established legal doctrine of the committee and some innovations. I think all general comments have both sides, but the balance is very different. You have general comments that are mainly a systematization of, of what have already been said by the committee. There is nothing very new uh, because uh, the, the, the treaty body has already a very robust doctrine 
let's see, for instance, the, 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 the general comment of the Human Rights Committee on the Right to Life. Uh, you don't find things that are surprising, but it's a very good systematization of the legal doctrine of the committee of the Human Rights Committee on that issue, or our general comment on the right on the adequate conditions of of, of work. Um, and you have other general comments in which the committee the committees are entering in new new uh, new terrain on 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 on, on, on uncharted terrain, uh, and in those cases you have you are obliged to innovate. I would say that the general comment on science is the, uh, this kind of second general comments. Uh, why? Because uh, on, on the right to science, on the right to benefit of science and, and the relation with, of science with human rights, you don't have a lot of legal doctrine, not even in academic, you don't have a lot of case law in international human rights bodies, and the committee didn't have really a very long practice on that. If you see the, the concluding observations of the committee in relation to states, uh, you don't find a lot of things about science. Uh, so we didn't have a lot of legal precedents. And so um, it's, it was a, a, a general comment Build to innovate, to establish, a, to try to establish a new legal doctrine. So that's the first idea, and we assume that. With that, we we, we have a, a second uh, dilemma, and the second dilemma is uh, what what is the the reasonable thing to do for a committee when it enters in on charter territory? Uh, you have to be bold. And, and try to, to, to innovate a lot, or you have to be very prudent. Uh, you have to take very controversial issues, or you have to avoid them uh, in order to, to not make a lot of mistakes, because you, it's not the, the issue that you, you know uh, a lot. Uh, so in, in, that, in, that, uh, uh, the, in, in that dilemma, I think we took a, a kind of, uh, there was a internal discussions. Some people said, you have to, we have to be very prudent because we are not experts in science. Uh, uh, and others, I was in, in this side, we said, if the committee doesn't enter in, in a lot of crucial current uh, subjects, uh, we are going to lose an opportunity to uh, make uh, a human rights approach to these subjects. So what we decide is that we wouldn't try to avoid uh, the most important issues concerning the relation of rights to, uh, of science with economic, social, and cultural rights. But when we enter in this, for instance, let's see the, the, the four industrial revolution and the new technologies, a very complicated issue, but we said if the committee doesn't say anything about that, it, it would seem strange. So we said we 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 are we are not going to be shy with these issues, but we are going to be very prudent. That is, in in the issues in which we, we don't have a real clear expertise, we are going to say the minimum things that we are sure about that, uh, and and that's what we have done. Uh, but we enter in complex issues. Uh, uh, intellectual property, uh, uh, the full revolution, uh, the relation of science and public policy, the, the, the subject of LIA, etc. Um, the, the third is related with that uh, was the scope of the, of, of the general comment and the title of the general comment. Uh, and uh, as, as you can see, uh, uh, Kate, when, when was uh, initiating the, the conversation, said uh, Rodrigo is going to speak about the general comment on the right to science. But when you read uh, the invitation made by the Bonavero Institute, they said is uh, the general comment on the right to benefit on scientific advancement. And if you read the title of the general comment is science and economic, social and cultural rights. And that's because we have a, 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 an internal discussion about what was the the right that we were dealing with is a, a, this notion of right to science that was proposed by UNESCO, or we should focus on a more textual uh, right that is clearly in the Universal Declaration on on the Covenant, the right to benefit from scientific advancement and its applications, 
or it's something in between. What we decide is, and, and that's the mixture of, 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 of not avoiding complex issues, but being prudent, what is we took a middle ground uh, position. That is, we don't affirm clearly that is a, there is such a thing as an encompassing right to science, but we open the door to that in the, I think is the uh, last part of the second paragraph of the committee, we say, we are dealing of the relation on, on the science, on the relation of science and economic, social and cultural rights. And people call that the right to science. But the methodology that we use was very traditional, very, if you want, very conservative. That is, we say to deal with that, we are going to use this methodology. We are going to focus on a textual right that is in the covenant, the right to benefit from scientific and advanced scientist application, but if, uh, with a very broad view. And this very broad view uh, would allow us to, to make a, a general, uh, to, 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 to discuss general relationships between science and all economic, social, and cultural rights. So the, the general communist focus on the right to benefit from scientific advancement, but it's not only on that. It's on the relationship between science and economic, social, and cultural rights. And with that, it, dial, it, it makes a dialogue with the notion of the right to science. So, uh, so it's open to that. Uh, and with this uh, prudent but uh, uh, not shy approach, um, the, the four methodological discussion was the very tricky issue of the notion of science. Uh, what is the notion of science that we are going to use? Um, and at the beginning, we have a, a lot of strong philosophical discussions. Uh, we are going to use, uh, 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 I don't know, Popper's approach of science that's falsifiability. And we say, we are not philosophers. We, we are not experts on that. Uh, so what's the, the, the best approach? And we said the best approach and, and that has to deal also with the sources, the authoritative, authoritative sources that we have used to build the, the general comment, knowing that there is not a lot of legal precedence on the relationship between science and economic social and, and human rights. So we said we have to, to make a strong dialogue with UNESCO. Uh, why UNESCO? Because it's an intergovernmental uh, organization that makes part of the United Nations system. Uh, uh, and it's the organization that is experts on culture and science. So we decide to use a lot of legal sources coming, a lot of our soft law, but a lot of legal sources coming from uh, UNESCO to build concepts and uh, to reflect on some obligation of states. And so you, we use the notion of science uh, that uh, or the definition of science that is uh, proposed by uh, UNESCO in in its general in, in its recommendation of 2017, I think, on on scientific uh, freedom and scientists. So these were, if you want, the, the the main methodological discussion that we have. Having solved this discussion, then we use a more traditional approach. So we said we are going to focus on the right to benefit of science and open it, a, a, a broad, a, a broad uh, interpretation of this right. And then we use the traditional approach of the committee. That is to see the legal content, to see the, the, the elements of the right, to see the obligations, and to see the topics uh, or special topics that uh, are important and the notion of general international cooperation and implementation, which if you see all the general comments of the committee related to rights is the traditional structure that the committee use. So it begins with textual reading of the right. Uh, uh, that's what we call the content of the right. We see the elements of the right, availability, uh, accessibility, uh, acceptability, etc. We see the different obligation in relation to the right, uh, general obligation on discrimination, uh, obligation uh, uh, duty to respect, protect, fulfill. Uh, we see then uh, uh, international dimension uh, uh, and the specific uh, issues. Uh, so, 
uh, in that sense, it becomes a, a more uh, traditional general comment of our comic. And um, in, in, in spite of being uh, uh, quite traditional, I, I think that the general comment has some innovative aspects and some important aspects. And with that, I enter in, in, in the second part of my presentation, that is, which are, I think are the contributions or, or, or the, the possible contribution of the, of the general comment. The, the first is, uh, I think, the, the notion of uh, the, the content of the right. Is, is the right a, a right only to passively benefit from what scientists make, or that uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a right that involves the possibility of anyone to participate in the scientific endeavor? Uh, and we, uh, for several reasons, we chose the, the second notion. So that's what we said, it's the right to benefit uh, from scientific advancement and to participate in scientific advancement. There were several legal reasons. Uh, the, the, one of the main is uh, the, the text of the Universal Declaration uh, on on the on 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 the on this right that uh, uh, in English it, it it speaks about to share a, a scientific progress, but in in French, and Spanish, and, and Russian it, it speaks about participating, uh, and we think that this broad view is better. It's it's more compatible with uh, with uh, tra uh, transversal uh, uh, cross cutting human rights principle as participation, accountability, etc. And it's not a minor issue because if you have this broad view, for instance, when you speak about discrimination against women, uh, you don't only speak about the that the application of science are discriminatory, but that women are discriminated in the possibility of participating in scientific uh, uh, endeavors. Uh, so we choose this. A broad view of the notion of the right to participate to to, to to benefit from science, and this has to do, and I think uh, it, it, they are very connected uh, with the notion of that the benefits of science are not only its uh, its technical applications. Of course, these are crucial, but that benefits of science are also the knowledge. Uh, what but what some scientists a lot of times said uh, uh, the, the the aesthetical and ethical beauty of science uh, but also uh, the way in which scientific education can contribute to create a critical thinking that is crucial for having a, a democratic citizenry so we said that the benefits are threefold applications material applications, the knowledge that science have and how it contributes to, 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 to have a more human uh, life and uh, the creation of uh, the contribution to critical uh, thinking. Uh, uh, and so that's uh, one, one, one important aspect. A second aspect is uh, that the duty of states in relation to science is not only to allow science to develop, that is a, a negative obligation, but as in, in, in most economic, so in all economic, social and cultural rights, it, it has a, an obligation to make the right available, but in relation to science, this uh, obligation to make the right available, that is that uh, uh, to make sure that science is developing. Um, in, uh, in relation to science, it has two textual bases. It's not the general right, but that uh, states have a specific obligation to promote uh, the, the, the development of science and its dissemination. Uh, and with that, we, we, we emphasize uh, the issue of open science. Uh, I think uh, even if we don't deal with that, uh, 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 in a detailed form, it's it's a general comment uh, that push strong for open science, and and that has several implications. For instance, when we deal with the issue of intellectual property, uh, that sometimes intellectual property becomes a barrier for uh, uh, people accessing the benefits of the science 
or even the knowledge that is developed by science. For instance, all this discussion that uh, 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 copyrights make very difficult in uh, low-income countries for uh, scholars to access the, the last developments of science. So the committee pushed strongly to uh, for states to promote uh, open science and to promote access uh, to science. The third that is obvious, but uh, but uh, I think that, uh, that there are important uh, aspects in the general comment is in relation to uh, the obligation of non-discrimination. Uh, and uh, 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 I'm not going to speak about that, it's very well known, but uh, what, I, what I think is that the committee emphasized uh, the importance of this obligation with several specific groups. Uh, one of these groups being clearly women uh, and the committee uh, uh, emphasized uh, how uh, this, this is a field in which uh, a, a, subtle, a, a subtle and usually not very open discrimination against parti the participation of women in science exists. Uh, and that in itself is a discrimination, but also has uh, impacts in, 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 in the products that are made by science that uh, a lot of times are not uh, uh, <clears throat> gender sensitive. So the committee emphasized that uh, a gender approach to uh, scientific endeavors is not a, a luxury, and it's not a thing that you add at the end of the research, but that should be incorporated since the beginning. So, so I think with, 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 with the issue of non-discrimination is this issue of incorporating the non-discrimination principle since the beginning of scientific developments and not only in the application and at, uh, and at the end. <clears throat> with that, we, we, dealt, we, we have dealt also with the very complex issue. And, and here we have been, I think, very prudent of the relationship between science and other knowledges, uh, science and, and uh, indigenous knowledge, indigenous culture. Um, and uh, the, 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 the way we dealt with that was to say that, uh, uh, of course, uh, states have a duty <clears> of <throat> participation of indigenous people and other traditional knowledge, peace and knowledge uh, in the elaboration of science. Uh, and benefit of science that they have also a duty to protect this knowledge, but we didn't uh, 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 went in the way to say that uh, uh, any kind of knowledge is scientific knowledge. Uh, we said that uh, a knowledge to be called scientific <clears throat> need to meet some criteria that are the criteria proposed by UNESCO, <coughs> for instance, critical thinking, a kind of possible of intersubjective uh, verific verification, et cetera. Uh, and so that doesn't mean that this other cultural knowledge is not protected, it's protected as culture, but some are, knowledge, some are scientific and others not. Uh, so that we, th we know that is a, a very complex and, 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 and uh, polemic and, and, and controversial issue but we, we said that the best way to approach uh, this uh, uh, notion. A fourth contribution is the one uh, that I already mentioned, and is when we speak about participation in science, uh, the, the principle of participation in science. Uh, one of, the, uh, uh, one of the, the, the main ideas that, that uh, goes in, in the general comment all the way is this, uh, importance of science for public policy. Uh, of course, we are we, we are not defending the, the idea that uh, public uh, that scientists has to become the new uh, king philosophers of Plato. No, no, that's not the idea. But that public policies should be informed by scientific knowledge and scientific developments, and that in that sense, states have a duty. Uh, uh, when, when it's possible, not always it's possible, to uh, 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 be transparent, 
how the their public policy are based or not based on the last scientific developments. Uh, I think that's crucial. Uh, we have seen in the issue of the pandemic. Uh, uh, so, so uh, I think that it's uh, uh, an important uh, issue. <clears throat> and finally, uh, in order to to stick uh, uh, in the time, um, we we have. The, the committee deals uh, or the general comment deals with the, I think the more controversial, uh, if you want, uh, uh, three issues uh, in relation to scientific developments uh, uh, now. Um, the first one is the relationship between intellectual property and science. Uh, the committee in that has been very prudent, but I think make clear, um, clear um, um, uh, guidance uh, in, in, in this aspect. The main argument of the committee is that intellectual property is not a human right. It has said, it has said already that in a previous general comment, uh, the, the, the human rights is the right to authorship. That is that authors are protected in the, in the material benefits and uh, moral benefits if they are the creators of science or culture or art, but uh, intellectual property is a, a, an economic regime that sometimes can uh, help develop, uh, protect uh, the, the right of authors and also uh, can help de uh, to develop science, but sometimes become an obstacle. For instance, because <clears throat> intellectual property distort uh, the, the, uh, the orientation of scientific development, uh, uh, it, that's very clear in health issues, the, the so-called neglected diseases, uh, which are diseases that, that are not, uh, uh, for instance, malaria in, 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 the, in, in the global south that has not been uh, strongly researched. Um, and sometimes uh, patents uh, 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 and other aspects of intellectual property can become an obstacle to access uh, scientific advancement that are crucial uh, or scientific knowledge that is crucial to continue the development of science. So we have said that before the pandemic. Uh, and of course, now I think it's uh, the crucial discussion in relation to vaccines uh, all over the world. Uh, is, 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 is the proposal of South Africa and India to, uh, 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 for a waiver for some intellectual property rights, uh, the, the best way to approach uh, 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 the efforts to make uh, uh, vaccines uh, uh, accessible all over the world in an equitable manner or not. So what we have said de there, we have developed, we, we have developed them uh, in our in, in in our statements that we have made this year, uh, last year and this year in relation to the pandemic and vaccines, and in that uh, statements we have said uh, essentially development uh, uh, development on, on on these ideas uh, that 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 we clearly endorse the proposal of making a waiver on intellectual property rights because we think it's the the, the right way to approach uh, the possibility of making universally uh, uh, accessible and affordable vaccines. So intellectual property is one issue. The, the second issue is the issue of uh, 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 new technologies or, or the four revolution uh, that, that we don't know where is going to, to, to go. Um, uh, but that that is changing dramatically a, a lot of issues in human rights, for instance, privacy uh, in relation to to surveillance uh, or, or artificial intelligence and and, and discriminate and possible discrimination, um, and 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 we we said how to deal with that, how to deal with that, and here we have been very very prudent. We say we are not experts, but at least uh, we 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 have to say uh, uh, three things that we thought were important. The first thing is the importance of international cooperation in this field. That is a duty of states. A duty of states in general uh, uh, for all economic, social, and cultural rights, but specifically with science. Uh, why international cooperation is crucial 
because the benefits of this technology or its risk uh, uh, need to be approached in a global way. If you don't approach them in a global way, you create gaps of governance that can become very, very, very problematic. For instance, uh, if you don't have a, a general regulation about the possibility of creating automatic weapons uh, 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 designed by inte uh, artificial intelligence, then if you don't have a general uh, regulation on that, then you have will have competition of states in that issue and you create uh, a very problematic situation. The, the, the second is uh, the importance of incorporating in the design and implementation of these new, new technologies since the beginning, a human right approach. That can, that can, see, can, can be seen as very general, but I think that is a, not a minor issue. For instance, for the algorithms of uh, artificial intelligence, the importance of making the algorithm, algorithms as long as possible transparent in order to see if they are discriminatory or not. Uh, so these are very important issues. And the third, that uh, to evaluate and to monitor the impact of uh, some specific uh, technological developments and its impact, in its impact on specific populations. Uh, for instance, uh, automatization, create, uh, the loss of jobs, and the duty of state to support uh, people who are losing these jobs uh, in order to uh, protect their right to work. And the final issue, and with that I uh, am going to finish, is the issue of international cooperation. Uh, that is a, a, a late motive of, of the general comment all over the, the, the text, uh, but the committee emphasized with this international dimension of, uh, in relation to the right to science, to, to use this language, I'm in favor of the notion of the right to science, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, because with international cooperation, the benefits of science uh, uh, can be uh, uh, really uh, uh, more accessible for low income countries. Countries, but also that the risks, the 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 the, import, the, the threats that the world is uh, uh, facing, uh, only can most of these threats only can be can be dealt uh, efficiently uh, in relation to science with a uh, strong international cooperation. Uh, uh, when we were when we were writing the general comment. Uh, or, or adopting the general comment, it was already written. The pandemic was beginning. Uh, and I think that uh, we, I don't need to, to, to emphasize the importance of international cooperation in science uh, after the pandemic. Uh, the pandemic has shown that uh, crucially, uh, if you don't have a early warning system in relation to uh, epidemics, then an epidemic, a local epidemic can become very quickly a pandemic. And if you don't have cooperation uh, in science, then the technological advancements uh, for combating uh, these threats as climate change or, or pandemics uh, 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 is going to be weak. Uh, we have been, we, we have seen a strong international cooperation in scientific advancement for vaccines not so in the distribution and production of vaccines, but on the creation, and then in the distribution of benefits. So I think that uh, the pandemic has shown the importance of what we have said in the general comment in relation to all those issues. And with that, I uh, finish. Uh, I was trying just to make a general overview of the crucial uh, dilemmas that we have faced and the main contribution that I think that uh, this general comment can have. And uh, of course, if we defend science, I'm very open to critical thinking by Leah and others uh, uh, in relation to this general comment. Thank you. Well, thanks, Rodrigo. That was extremely clear and really helpful and just exactly the uh, kind of approach we hoped you would adopt. So thank you for that. And I'm going to turn now to Leah to hear what, what she might think about, uh, might like to say about this. 
Thank you so much, uh, Kate, and thank you so much to Professor Aprimni. It's just such a, a privilege to to be here to comment on the comment on the on the comment. Um, but I, I just I admire enormously Professor Aprimni's work and support for the Colombian police process in particular. So I, I feel just really lucky to be here. I think his work is really remarkable and inspiring, both on the comment and in, in other contexts. Um, I'm a huge fan of the content, which I think is outstanding. I loved hearing about the methodology, and I really thought it it succeeded on the two methodological metrics that Professor Aprimni put out. You know, this idea of innovation, I think it absolutely does carve new ground and striking this balance between prudence and, and innovation. I, I, I really did think it, it succeeded. And I should say I became interested in this topic because my partner is a scientist. So the main benefits in inverted commas I've had so far on the on science are early morning lectures or meditations on if there's phosphine on Venus. So it's great instead to read this wonderful, you know, reflection or manifesto for the benefits of science in the context of humanity as a whole. It, it's just a terrific document and I commend it all to you wholeheartedly. So I just wanted to raise three sort of groups of questions that I'd love to hear uh, Professor Primney talk a little bit about if that's okay, um, mainly because I just think they're so interesting. The first is about as um, he mentioned about scope and about the different benefits potentially we're talking about, the relationship between the benefits of science and economic social uh, rights more generally. Second, about the nature of uncertainty and as in terms of the scientific method and how that impacts the right to the benefit of the science. And then third, uh, something I'm uh, interested in that I can't really resist asking about, about the influence of, of science on policy making. So, as Professor Aprimni put so well, but I think it might be worth, worth um, repeating, the comment says that there are three ways that um, it defines benefits in three ways. So first, in terms of material applications, talking about uh, developments like fertilizers. Second, in terms of scientific knowledge and information deriving from scientific activity as a whole, the intellectual project of science. And third, critical and responsible citizenship. And as he says, the comment also says at paragraph three, it aims to develop more broadly the relationship between science and economic and, and social and cultural rights. So, and it, so it's based on Article 15, but it also mentions Article 11, the right to part of the right to food, and Article 12 about the right to, to health. But I guess one thing I was really curious about that I, I'd love to hear more if these were decisions, you know, of scope. It sounds like, as Professor Primney says, they really felt like the, the gap was about participation, which I think is really interesting. So I, it seemed to me benefits were being used maybe in potentially three different ways which related to, to different economic and social and cultural rights. So the first seems something like blue sky science, which is our, what Article 15 seems to be about, and Article 27 of the UN Declaration, which is where we're talking about gender diversity in science, freedom of thought, you know, right to participate. And the second, which the comment said a little bit less about, which I'd be interested to talk about, is existential and security benefits of science. There I'm talking about pandemics, climate change, especially Article 7, fair and, and just working conditions. And in the section on, on food, it does come up in the section on food, but I'd be curious to hear a little bit more about, it did seem to me some benefits of science are potentially, as I say, existential. They get to um, some of the deeper questions about the right to work and self-determination. And I wondered if the decision not to consider that is, um, as I say, for reasons of prudence and scope, or if genuinely perhaps we think that's not where we want to go because the, the right to the benefits of science is anchored in this blue sky idea of science in Article 15. And then third, um, educational benefits, which seem to me to be related to Article 13, so, something like that. So this is all just probably a long-winded way of saying, I wonder whether we're talking about different kinds of scientific benefits sometimes um, and what the implications are for the right to the benefit of science of, art, of anchoring it, as it seems to me, in Article 15 and Article 27, when, as the comment itself says, there are natural connections across um, economic, social, and cultural rights. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about that, uh, potentially. The second question I wanted to raise or the, the thought was about um, uncertainty in science. So it seems to me a challenge in innovating in this space is that, you know, science as a body of knowledge is that as the comment does, does to some extent say is, is uncertain. So the benefit is not only um, in telling us what we know, but in the limits of our understanding of telling us what we don't know. And I wonder about the implications of that for thinking about the benefits of science, both in terms of the the actual applications and in terms of the benefits of science in 
critical thinking capacity in the limits of, of human knowledge in general. So this idea of uncertainty, I'd be curious to hear Professor Okremini talk about. And the third um, very quick point I wanted to raise. So the comment says that states should align their policies with the best science available. And I'm a little bit hesitant about the, uh, the word align, but there's really wonderful meditations in the comment about what this then means. And it rightly says this requires public trust of science. And very interestingly, that then there's a dialogue between science and society. And I think that's the only place that I've ever seen that. And I think it invites, it says, goes on to say there has to be a democratic dialogue between scientists and society. And I just wondered if, if uh, Professor Primi wanted to say anything about that, because that seems to me to be just unbelievably important. If it is the case that we're going to say, nope, this is what should be guiding dry government decision making, then what kinds of obligations it puts on scientists, for example, or what sorts of caveats or conditions should be used on public funding for science in terms of all of the great points that were mentioned about equality and diversity, um, discrimination, outreach and engagement. So I was really interested in, in what kinds of obligations that through public money, I, I recognize that the common is directed at, at states, but what kind of downstream implications um, that might have for scientists. But I think it's just a fantastic uh, comment. As I say, it's a huge privilege to um, comment on the comment on the comment. Uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, everything everyone else had and Professor Premney has to say. Wonderful, thanks, Leah. So I'm gonna give Rodrigo an opportunity to uh, respond to those now. And then just to encourage people who are here to please put any questions you've got in the Q&A. We already have some, but please feel free to do so. But I thought, Rodrigo, you might like to respond directly to Leah immediately. Hey, thank you, Leah. Thank you for your very kind words and thank you for your excellent reflections and, and, and questions that, that are very, very interesting and, and not uh, very, very easy. Uh, uh, the first uh, uh, one is about uh, uh, these other existential issues related to science and why we have not dealt with them more, more systematically. There, there are two, uh, two or three answers. Uh, the, the first one is the, the easiest one, and, uh, but it, it's not at all, um, but, but it's real. And I, I would mention with uh, one, uh, with what number is, uh, 10,650 words. That's the limit of any UN general document. We, we cannot go beyond that. Uh, and, and it's a very, at, at the beginning for me, uh, it was, uh, I said, wow, she, it's, it's impossible. Uh, but at the end, it's a, a, very, a very creative uh, uh, restriction that, that, that in, 20 pages, you, you have to put all. Uh, so, so if you want to incorporate something, you have to take out and other things. So, so there were some aspects that we saw. Uh, 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 for instance, uh, should we, uh, we mentioned some things about education and science, but you were right. Uh, the only two rights that we, we, deal, we deal directly in the general comment uh, uh, the right to food and the right to health. Um, but why not to speak uh, more clearly about education, uh, conditions of work, which are strongly related uh, to scientific advancement. You are totally uh, uh, right. Um, so what we make is a, a general notion of interdependency uh, that it's quite obvious, but it's important. And then we said, uh, and, and, and that we could we, we cannot deal with uh, all the aspects in which uh, uh, it's uh, the relation between science and other economic, social, and cultural rights is crucial, existential. Um, I like I like this 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 notion. Um, so we have to choose, um, and and in the choosing, it was a mixture of. Um, um, critical choosing and a kind of, uh, which I shouldn't say that, but, but that, that's the real world. 
in, in which in which aspect we have expertise and and the right to food was an obvious point because we have Oliver the shooter in our comedy the former special rapporteur on the right to food. It, it, it was impossible not to say something about the right to food. And we said to Olivier, if you, do, if you don't make to us two or three paragraphs on the right to food, um, I will never have lunch with you again. Uh, so so that, that we said that's crucial. And we think it was intrinsically crucial. And the second, it was really a decision that was the right to have. Uh, we said in, 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 in which aspect it was before the pandemic, we, we have this paragraph before the pandemic, but we said in, in which aspect uh, the relationship with science and, 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 and other economic, social and cultural right is so complex in which the right can benefit, uh, the science can benefit a lot, but science can also uh, uh, make harm and uh, create inequity. Uh, and we said it's health. Uh, and so th that was the, the reason we have chosen this, uh, these two, two rights. Uh, but I hope that uh, the, the approach that we have developed in the, in the general comment is useful for the other rights. The one that we have at, at one moment, some paragraphs, and we have to take them out because of the limits of words, what also education. Uh, I think, uh, the relation between science and education is crucial uh, because uh, we said some some aspects. We said, for instance, that uh, 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 states for uh, avoiding discrimination have to develop uh, 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 to provide uh, uh, children of of, of uh, children with with disabilities and, and children of minorities with uh, sound scientific education in order not to create obstacles for them to pursue a scientific career, uh, things like that. But uh, I agree totally that uh, that's a thing to be, to be done afterwards, uh, after the, the, the general comment. The second was, uh, and, and I, I, I love that idea of the relationship between science and uncertainty, that science can uh, help us to, to uh, uh, acquire some little certainties, but in other cases it said, no, in that you have to be, uh, your, 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 your certainty is that this field is uncertain uh, and, and that's crucial. We dealt with that in one part uh, and, and, we, in, and, and there we were very, very uh, prudent and was in the precautionary principle. Uh, in, in the precautionary principle, we tried to adopt a precautionary approach to the precautionary principle. <laughs> that is, a, it's a very crucial principle. Um, we, 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 we think it's very important, uh, but uh, it would be very problematic to make it absolute because all things have risks. Uh, and so that if you see this paragraph with the precautionary principle, we avoid a very technical view of the precautionary principle. It's more a dialogue participatory deliberative approach to the precautionary principle. That is, that is a duty of states uh, to make transparent the risks and to uh, allow a conversation, an open conversation of those <clears throat> of stakeholders and those who, who could be affected to take to participate in this conversation and then to take a decision because the precautionary principle is not uh, absolutely technical, but uh, in, involves values and discussion. Uh, <clears throat> and that has to do with the third part uh, that is uh, the relationship between uh, science and, and uh, or, or scientific advancement uh, 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 or best scientific evidence and uh, public policy. Um, our main approach, uh, and, 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 and I, I, I agree with you that align policies with uh, the the, the best scientific evidence might be controversial. 
maybe it was not the best wording, now I see it. Uh, but the idea was uh, uh, to, to make possible uh, that uh, science is a part of discussion of public policies and that this discussion is robust and transparent. At the end of the day, and that has to do with the issue of certainty and uncertainty, at the end of the day, uh, public officials, including judges, have to take decisions and take responsibility for this decision. Don't say, no, I'm just, I'm just saying what science says, because sometimes science you don't know. And, and, and you have to take actions with this uncertainty. So you have to take your own responsibility but that you have made transparent what is the scientific evidence. What, what we have to create is a, a, a relationship, a, for instance, a, in, in the discussion in Colombia, I, 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 I wrote to the president saying, with the pandemic, you, you, you have to take the decision, uh, Mr. President, but you should have a scientific board uh, that make transparent what we know and what we don't know about the pandemic. What is the basis of your policy decisions? And that we citizens know that. At the end, you have to take the decision, not the scientists. But we have to create this kind of, of space, not, not that, that the president says, uh, no, I don't think so. And, and the scientific, the strong scientific consensus is the contrary and he, he or she ignores it. That's what we want to avoid. <clears throat> but of course, we are, as, as I said in my presentation, we are not defending uh, the, the, the scientist king. No, no, that's not the idea that, that would be technocratic and problematic. But one issue uh, that I wanted to, to show this importance, because it's an issue that I have worked on, uh, is about drug policy uh, on illegal drugs. We, we said there, Okay, if there is one field in which they, there should be more alignment <clears throat> between scientific developments and policies, it's about drug policies. For instance, a lot of the, of the controlled substances uh, were forbidden without any scientific basis. Um, <clears throat> and Leah, in, in, in a blog that he, she has published, she speak about this uh, scientist that said, Okay, ecstasy is not so 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 harmful as you said, and and he was dismissed <clears throat> from his post. So that's the thing that we have to defend. That, that said, okay, what is the scientific basis for you to forbid this substance, uh, and why do you don't have updating your data on that? And and that's what I defend in the relation between public policy and <clears throat> uh, scientific uh, uh, development. And thank you very much for your great comments, Leah. No, thank you so much, Ansel. That was absolutely fascinating. I'm so grateful. Well, thank you for a really uh, interesting exchange. And now we've got some interesting questions from our audience. So I'm just going to put them to you. So the first one is um, uh, about the question about the transparency about the use and sources of scientific advice, whether there were other factors that the committee discussed to help determine whether states might be said to have discharge the obligation to adopt mechanisms aimed at aligning government policies and programs with the best available generally accepted scientific evidence, i.e. whether it was the, um, they based their policies on scientific consensus or the status and credentials of the scientific advisors and the kind of scientific evidence in question. So the question really is that the focus is actually just on transparency. Tell us what sources you've used but you know, would it have been possible, or do you think in future it might be appropriate to further um, structure the nature of decision-making here to include uh, questions of whether they've investigated, whether there is a scientific consensus and the credentials of the scientists involved, et cetera. Um, any thoughts on that, Rodrigo? Uh, you're on mute. Sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, Yes, um, it's a very difficult question. Um, and in this question, we really have been very prudent. Um, it, it, it's this very complex session, uh, how 
you evaluate the quality of science and how you evaluate uh, the the um, what is the scientific consensus on an issue. Um, and with that, uh, what we had defended uh, when we speak about the elements of the rights, when we speak about quality, we say that the uh, states should develop uh, or, or allow to develop mechanism uh, that uh, create uh, um, or, or regulation that uh, um, make uh, a possible a transparent evaluation of the quality of the science produced, uh, that is peer review or things like that. Um, but uh, we know that uh, uh, it's a controversial issue now uh, because sometimes uh, there are conflicts of interest in the peer review or there are um, economic interest uh, on, 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 on making uh, uh, profitable some kind of uh, uh, scientific uh, analysis, uh, etc. So what we said is a more a procedural approach. That is, uh, you have uh, to develop mechanisms to allow the evaluation of the quality of scientific advancement uh, and, and, and provide freedom of scientific researchers. Uh, you have to create mechanisms to make a transparent conflict of interest and how to deal with conflict of interest. And we have this discussion now in Colombia in relation to glyphosate. Like, I don't know glyphosate because of the discussion of on spraying on illicit crops. And, and as you know, you have this controversy between uh, the WHO and uh, the, 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 the cancer research of the WHO that is that says that uh, glyphosate is a, a possible ca a a, a, a possible create a cancer in humans and uh, uh, the EPA in the United States that have said that no, there is not such a evidence. Um, so you have to make transparent possible conflict of interest uh, where the sources come. Uh, and, and, and make it transparent in, in order to have with the degree of, un un of uncertainty that always goes with science to say that the, 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 the main consensus in science is that, uh, but there are some controversies. Uh, and uh, so that, that was a, a second, the, the possible conflict of interest, for instance, in the critic for the EPA, a, 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 a evaluation in the United States, they said that they a, a, took on board too many a, researches made by a, a, the, the, the companies themselves and not by peer review a, articles, whereas a, the WHO is based essentially on peer review articles, so it seems more impartial and sound for me. A, so, and the third is that when the policy is going to be adopted, uh, you have to make transparent these sources, the possible certainties and the possible uncertainties. <clears throat> uh, so that's why we, 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 we propose a, a flexible notion of science in which uh, the, the kind of uh, critical thinking and intersubjective uh, discussion of the truth of what you are saying is crucial and procedural and procedural mechanism uh, to evaluate the quality of science and the scientific consensus and a duty of states to <clears throat> take on consideration these scientific developments, not, uh, not forcibly to follow them, but take them on, on consideration and make transparent the decision they are taking. Yeah. We we were not able to go further, and I think that was the prudent uh, uh, tone to do it. Well, thank you, and it fits very well with your disc discussion earlier or your introduction earlier, talking about this balancing between a kind of prudence and innovation, and uh, so that's a very clear answer. Thank you. Um, turning to the next question, the question points to the fact that back in general comment number 17, uh, the committee said that the right to science would be partly explored in GC 17, 
but also in separate general comments on Article 15, paragraphs 1a and b, and also three of the covenant. And the questioner says whether we are going to get a general comment on Article 15, 3, which of course is the provision which says that the state's parties res will respect the freedom indispensable for scientific research and creative activity. So it's about the freedom to engage in scientific research. And do you foresee that it's likely that we may get a special general comment on that? Or do you think that that's something that's not immediately on the uh, program of the committee? Uh, what I would say is not in my time. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we have, uh, 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 that's why we, 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 we say we, it, our general comment is not going to be only on uh, scientific, uh, uh, on the benefits of scientific progress, but a broader view. Uh, and we, we make some, some uh, we, we have dealt with some aspect of, of freedom of research, uh, not, not, not detail. It would be nice to have time to have a general comment on, on freedom of research. But uh, for the moment, uh, at least in the, in the next two years, we, we cannot do that because we have two general comments online with, with are very complex. One is on land and economic, social and cultural rights uh, that we have made public our first draft, uh, I think yesterday or today, I don't know, uh, for, for external comments, if you want, uh, I invite them. Uh, 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 that would be nice. Uh, and then we are working on a general comment on on uh, sust uh, sustainable development and economic, social, and cultural rights. So these are for the moment the, the two general comments that we are. Uh, we have a, a very interesting case in 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 which we 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 had uh, 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 we might have had the possibility of dealing with the freedom of research, which was the case uh, against Italy. But uh, unfortunately, it was in, in, in relation with this very uh, contested issue of uh, uh, scientific development on, on, on uh, embryos. Uh, uh, but uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know, uh, there was a problem of, of, of standing, and we decided that this aspect of the petition we are we were not going to deal with. Uh, we did we dealt with other aspect of the petition, but that was on one of the uh, of the issues were, were, uh, in relation to can a state forbid research on embryos uh, or not? A very complicated issue. Okay, well, that is an interesting and difficult question. Um, just in relation to one of your comments there about the program of the committee going forward, one of the questions is whether there was a reason for not uh, addressing the sustainable development goals. And, and perhaps one of the answers to that is that you're about to do a general comment on sustainable development and the um, eco uh, uh, economic, social and cultural rights. But is there anything further you'd like to say about the general comment not specifically addressing the sustainable de development goals? Yes, the, the, I think there were uh, two reasons. Uh, uh, the first, again, the the world limit. Uh, so we have to make decisions on, on what to focus. And the second, that we we were already engaged in the general comment on on sustainable development, and we have made a statement uh, uh, on the relationship between uh, uh, the SDGs and economic, social, and cultural rights almost at the same time that we were adopting the, the general comment, even I think three months before. So, so we said the, our main <clears throat> approach to the relationship between uh, uh, economic, social and cultural rights and SDGs is in this statement. And the more detailed development of this subject, we are going to make it in the general comment. So these were the reasons. Okay, now that's very clear. Thank you. So uh, one of our colleagues, Bonavera, has another question on public policy, and I'm just going to put it to you. You might feel that you've addressed it already, but it, I know that it's an issue that interests um, many of us um, about the relationship between science and policy. And of course, part of that interest has been sparked by the ways in which government have uh, responded to the pandemic and how they have spoken about their relationship with scientific advisors. So um, in, in the UK in particular, um, the government has said frequently that they are being led by science and it 
um, and, and the question is really, can it be that simple? Um, he, uh, he says that uh, we need a scientific grounding to determine what policy interventions can achieve or whether policy interventions can achieve the ends that we are hoping to achieve. But science can't define the ends. At the end of the day, we have to decide uh, what those ends should be. And largely, that's a, a normative question. And um, how should we account for the fact that science can't really uh, determine the kind of the ends of policy making uh, when we think about the relationship between science and public policy? Yes. Uh... Uh, these are the questions that I like because uh, in the formulation of the question is the answer. Uh, so <laughs> it's very easy to answer it. It's an excellent question. Uh, wh what I would say is exactly that. Uh, I, 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 I'm against a technocratical approach to public policy. Uh, no, it's not uh, public policy usually involved uh, conflict of values, um, and this conflict of values involves normative questions, and these normative questions involves a um, decision based on normative grounds. Um, and this should be taken either with uh, judges when it's a justiciable thing, or by politicians uh, that are uh, accountable to the people if it's a, a political question. Um, what I think is, uh, and I like, again, the blog of, of, of Leah, uh, we have to defend the independence of scientists to, to make critical appraisals. And we have to create mechanisms that, that these uh, scientific data and scientific consensus and scientific disagreements uh, are, <clears throat> incorporating, are incorporated in the public discussions and are made transparent. And at the end of the day, we know we as citizens, we as citizens, we will be uh, able to know what are the value choices that the government are making. Uh, but I totally agree that um, uh, is not a mechanical thing, that uh, this is science and this is the decision. No, this is science and uh, with that scientific development, this is the decision that as I, as government, I'm taking. And, and, and you cannot uh, avoid uh, this responsibility. Of course, for instance, in, in relation to the pandemic, the equilibrium between uh, protecting health uh, with social distancing measures and trying to protect uh, 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 economic recovery and, uh, and freedoms, these are, these are decisions that are not uh, 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 solved by science. Uh, it's it's a, a value judgment, and, and this value judgment uh, should be made transparent. But what science can can inform you is yes, this vaccine is is uh, has this percentage of safety. Uh, this vaccine. Or, 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 or effectivity, uh, and this vaccine has produced in these countries this diminution of, 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 of the death toll, uh, and, and you can take decisions based on that. Yeah, yeah. Th thanks very much, Rodrigo. Um, Leah, anything you'd like to, to say there, knowing that this is something that you've also thought quite carefully about? So, but thank you so much, Kate. I'm just really um, inspired by the way Professor Primney puts the puts the point. Sorry, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want you to be sitting there thinking, "Oh, I've got something to say." So, <laughs> oh, it's so it's so kind, it's so kind of you. Thank you so much. Okay. Against okay. we're against Professor Primney and I are against Plato. That's what we're really about. <laughs> That's what we're really. Uh, we're. Uh, you never know what the day will bring at the Bonavero, but we're against Plato today. <laughs> We'll make that our subtitle for the session. Um, uh, and then, and our last question then um, is from from another of our um, uh, of our, our, our RAs, in fact, in this case. And it's really about the terrible crisis that we actually discussed briefly before we started the panel um, on in India as as uh, COVID nineteen is ravaging India, um, which is exacerbated by the uh, lack of vaccines and the fact that many Western countries that are sitting on large stockpiles of vaccines and whether the UN or the committee has any kind of responsibility to comment or somehow intervene 
in defense of the right to benefit from scientific knowledge in circumstances which are as serious for uh, as, as, as now unfolding in India. Um, yes. Uh, um, what we have made um, uh, is uh, to, to make this statement uh, that, that we have issued, I think, uh, three weeks ago uh, when we were finishing our sessions. Um, and uh, in this statement, uh, we clearly said that uh, the, the I, I wouldn't put it, uh, we, we don't put it that way because the committee has to use uh, a, a more technical and normative language, but uh, in a more political tone, uh, I would say that this year was the, the, the success of science and, and, and the failure of ethics uh, and, poli and political discussion. That, that is, it's really amazing that in one year we have five or six or even more uh, safe and effective vaccines, but it's out outrageous that we are not producing enough vaccines, even if we, if we have the technical capability is this, if we didn't have the intellectual property restrictions, uh, all uh, in 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 some months we could have uh, the the uh, twelve billion vaccines that we need to vaccinate uh, to to have herd immunity all over the world. That that has been, I think, demonstrated uh, by Médecins Sans Frontières and and other. Uh, uh, discussions in, in this issue. Um, and uh, besides, uh, even if now Biden is changing the policy, and, and that's very important, <laughs> uh, the change of Trump by Biden is not a, at all a minor thing, uh, that they are going to export uh, vaccines uh, to India. Uh, but that has been when uh, uh, the United States was beginning to vaccinate uh, teenagers. Um, I'm not against that they vaccinate teenagers, but I'm, I'm against that when teenagers are vaccinated in a country where all people and health workers are not vaccinated all over the world, that's, that's uh, totally unacceptable. So what the committee said there is mainly that these imply a, a global discrimination against the right to uh, access to vaccination um, and that states have uh, obligations that go beyond uh, the jurisdiction, that they have extraterritorial obligations. And according to that extra extraterritorial obligation, states have to cooperate internationally to make uh, available vaccines all over the world. And that for that, um, the, 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 the one, um, element that was necessary was the waiver of intellectual property. That the waiver of intellectual property wouldn't solve automatically uh, everything, but without this waiver, what we have seen is that we will not have equitable uh, access to vaccination all over the world in this year, and maybe not even in the next. And when that happens, millions of people die, and we have new variants of the virus that can become more dreadful. Uh, so, so, and, and the economy will not recover. Even we know that we have this, this discussion between normative decisions and decision based on interest. But what I would say is that in this issue for developed countries, both, 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 both the, the it's, it's, it's a question in which both aspects go in the same direction. It's a very bad policy for uh, uh, developed countries not to allow the, the, the waiver because the pandemic will not be over and the economy will not recover and it will cost trillions of, 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 of dollars. Uh, but it's also a normative question uh, to 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 protect uh, the most vulnerable people in 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 the world. So yes, it's 
it's a kind of uh, of uh, I, I, I I've just written I I have just written an op-ed in in a, in a newspaper in Colombia in which I cited this beautiful sentence by Jean Rostand, which was a a biology a, a French bio, a, a biologist and also a poet, um, and and who said uh, science has made uh, humans called gods before they were. Uh, 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 be, because before it was even suitable to call them humans. Uh, and I think this uh, way the pandemic has developed has shown we, we have created these marvelous things, technological things that are these vaccines. And we are showing our worst aspects of humans without this uh, unequitable distribution of vaccines. But I think that our statement is good, is what we can do, we cannot do anymore. Yeah. Well, thank you very much indeed, Rodrigo. We also have a question about the Colombian peace process, but I think that might take us way beyond our time frame. So sorry to that questioner. Um, uh, we may well try and organize a, um, a, a discussion group to talk about where we are in the Colombian peace process sometime in the future. Yeah. So it's a really important issue. Um, but just to thank um, Rodrigo and Leah for their wonderfully clear and thoughtful um, uh, contributions this afternoon. Um, and also, again, to congratulate the committee on this really important general comment, which I think we're going to be looking at and drawing on for many years to come. It's, it's a really important piece of work. Um, and finally, to thank all of you who've been here and for your really interesting questions. And just to remind you that over the next week or so, we're back in term time. So there are a range of event, events uh, taking place um, at the Bonavero. Uh, next week in the discussion group, we're going to have a discussion on the cab rank rule uh, in the Commonwealth. It's been an issue that has caught the headlines both in Oxford and more broadly over the last few weeks. And we will have three practicing lawyers from uh, uh, three different parts of the Commonwealth, Gotham Bathia from India, uh, Geoffrey Budlander from South Africa, and Helen Mountfield from the UK, to talk about reflecting on the principles that underlie the cabman rule from the point of view of a practitioner and what it means for their own kind of uh, uh, decisions on a, on a, uh, in their practices. So that's next week on Tuesday. Tomorrow um, at, at um, uh, two o'clock, we've got a book launch of uh, the new book on multinational enterprises and the law being hosted by the um, Oxford uh, Business and Human Rights Network and a really interesting panel of people to talk about that. So for those of you who are interested in that, please join then. And on Friday, uh, the Bonavera is um, joining with Mansfield College to welcome uh, my former colleague, Justice Dakang Moseneke, former Deputy Chief Justice of South Africa, talking about his new book, all rise in conversation with Helen Mountfield and I'm going to do a brief introduction. So there's lots going on. Please feel free to join us at these events in the week ahead. Meanwhile, wish you well for the term. Thanks very much for joining, for joining us and thanks again to Rodrigo and Leah. Bye now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.